I'm Nima Rajan, and this is Forum Daily Week in Review. Canadian MPs are set to get an automatic pay raise in the coming days that would amount to over $3,000 extra added to their annual salaries, paid for by Canadian taxpayers. Senators, government ministers, the leader of the opposition, as well as the prime minister, are also going to get thousands of dollars of taxpayer money automatically added to their salaries. This comes as over 700,000 private sector jobs were lost over the last year. Within the province of Alberta alone, over 76,000 private sector jobs were eliminated, while at the same time, over 5,000 government jobs were added, according to Statistics Canada. Last spring, government officials were facing criticism over accepting pay raises while increasing the federal carbon tax amid the pandemic. This led Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, former Conservative leader Andrew Scheer and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh to be among a number of MPs who donated their automatic pay increases to charity last year. However, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation says this pay increase needs to be scrapped altogether, considering the inequities between private sector and government jobs. Well, to talk more on this, joining us now is Mr. Franco Terrazano, Alberta Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Always great having you on Forum Daily, sir. Hey, well, thank you so much for having me on today. Now, we spoke a little on salary ranges in our intro, but let's get into specific numbers, Mr. Terrazano. How much money in pay raises are we talking about here for individual MPs and other government officials? Well, I think it's pretty safe to say that a pandemic and severe economic downturn that we're facing right now is probably the worst possible time for our politicians to be padding their wallets. But like a cruel April Fool's joke for taxpayers, our MPs are set to get a pay raise on April 1st. And the pay raise breaks down to about uh, 3200 bucks for your backbench MP. Um, it's over $6,000 for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. That's what we're estimating. And it's important to remember here that our politicians are very well compensated in Canada. Your basic MP is making over $180,000. The Prime Minister is making well over $300,000. So I think many struggling taxpayers are rightly going to see this pay raise as a slap in the face. And how has this pay raise uh, been impacted over the years? Has it decreased or increased gradually? Well, this is an annual automatic pay change, and this is the second pay increase that we're seeing for MPs during this COVID-19 downturn. I mean, we've been in this downturn with COVID-19 for, for a year now. So why is it taking so long for our MPs to get off their butts and to actually make some change here for taxpayers? And I need to point out that there is precedent to stop the automatic pay increase. We saw that under the Harper government in response to that 08-09 recession. And we've also seen politicians all over the world take a pay cut almost right away uh, when COVID-19 first happened. We saw New Zealand's prime minister, ministers and top bureaucrats take a 20% pay cut to show solidarity with struggling taxpayers. And we need to see something like that here. Now, last spring, uh, leaders were facing uh, some criticism for, expect, uh, for accepting this pay increase. Uh, do we have any promises uh, to donate uh, these pay increases as uh, previous MPs did last year? Well, we do. We've got correspondence from about 90 members of Parliament who have said either that they are against this automatic pay raise or that they're going to be donating that money to charity. And you know what? That's all fine and dandy, but it's not enough because we shouldn't be seeing taxpayers paying for pay raises for MPs, especially during this uh, severe economic downturn. So what we want to see is, is something similar to what we saw in New Zealand, what we're seeing in other parts of Canada. We've seen politicians, councillors in Halifax, uh, councillors in Lethbridge, Alberta near my neck of the woods who have actually taken a pay cut and that's what we want to see from our MPs. Now we're speaking a little bit about inequities in pay between private sector and government jobs. In what other ways are disparities between these two uh, sectors apparent sir? Well, you know, we have seen a budding divide between taxpayers and government employees across Canada, especially during COVID-19. You know, we've seen hundreds of thousands of private sector jobs vanish. But across the country over the last year, we've seen an increase in the number of government jobs. And, and all that means is, is a higher tax burden for, for struggling families and struggling businesses who can least afford it. And, you know, I'm in here in Alberta and through freedom of information requests, we've also found that nearly 30,000 government employees received a pay raise during lockdowns in 2020. So that's really a slap in the face for the many, the many uh, private sector workers who took a pay cut, who may have lost their job or who may have lost their, their business and life savings. 
All right, Mr. Terrazano, about 30 seconds left, but what can Canadians do to voice their concerns around this yearly pay increase? Well, you have to contact your member of parliament, share with them your story that you're going through and, and let them know that you do not support a pay raise. And then it's time for them to get off their butts and make something happen and stop the automatic pay increase. Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta are all suspending the use of Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine for people under 55 years old. The decisions follow a recommendation by Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization yesterday amid concerns over some vaccine recipients in Europe developing rare blood clots. Alberta's chief medical officer, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, says there is no evidence of this happening anywhere in Canada and says the AstraZeneca vaccine still reduces the risk of hospitalization and death. Dr. Hinshaw says the suspension will allow Health Canada to conduct more research. Rising COVID-19 cases in British Columbia have forced the hand of provincial health officials who are reimposing some public health restrictions. From now until April 19th, indoor dining at restaurants and bars is on pause, along with adult group activity at fitness centres. Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry says she is also reversing a recent move to allow indoor faith gatherings. Premier John Horgan says BC's COVID case counts have risen to unacceptably high levels this past week because some people are ignoring the rules. He pleaded for people to curtail their social activity and, quote, do not blow this for the rest of us. Saskatchewan's opposition has called on Premier Scott Moe's Sask Party government to extend extra COVID-19 restrictions to Moose Jaw. Mr. Moe reinstated restrictions in Regina that include staying home and avoiding having guests following a recent surge in cases there. The health ministry began asking Moose Jaw residents over the weekend to do the same, but in a statement yesterday, Mr. Moe's office pointed to additional advice from Saskatchewan's chief medical health officer, Dr. Saqib Shahab, who is asking Moose Jaw residents to work from home, mask up in public, and avoid unnecessary travel. A fast-moving weather system created conditions in southern Alberta that led to a stubborn grass fire and six hours later, a massive highway crash in blinding snow. An Alberta clipper moved in Sunday, bringing a sudden temperature drop and sharp winds that whipped up a grass fire and forced 275 residents to flee the village of Carmen Gay, southeast of Calgary. The fire was stopped 11 kilometers outside town, but not before flames leveled four homes and injured eight people from smoke inhalation. Then ice and blowing snow moved in and led to a 70-vehicle collision Monday morning that closed the Trans-Canada Highway near Brooks and left five people hurt. The mayor of the district of North Vancouver says the stabbing rampage that happened in his municipality on Saturday was an absolute shock, adding that no one expects to be confronted by violence when they're simply going about their day. The mass stabbing attack outside a library left a woman in her 20s dead and six other people wounded. 28-year-old Yannick Bandango is charged with second-degree murder. Homicide investigators say that he is wanted on warrants in Quebec and Winnipeg. Alberta's government wants to know how its people feel about coal mining in the Rocky Mountains. Energy Minister Sonia Savage says a five-member committee will decide how to gather input on whether Albertans want open-pit coal mining in the mountains and their eastern slopes. The committee includes former bureaucrats who have worked in the environmental field, an area landowner, and a member of an Indigenous band. Ms. Savage is also promising an online survey and says there will be separate talks with First Nations. The president of the Ontario Hospital Association says the province could face a new surge in patient transfers and cancelled surgeries as it deals with a third wave of the COVID-19 in the weeks ahead. Anthony Dale says if the trend of increasing patient numbers arriving in the province's hospitals continues, it will further strain capacity. Mr. Dale says that will lead to patient transfers running 24-7 to ensure they receive life-saving care and additional cancelled surgeries that will be added to the current backlog of 250,000 procedures. 
The federal government is spending $1 million to support two seafood businesses in Cape Breton. Northside Processing Limited in North Sydney is receiving a $450,000 loan to acquire packaging machinery, creating up to 12 new jobs. And Victoria Cooperative Fishering, Fisheries Limited in Neils Harbour is receiving a $450,000 loan for a new storage building and ice-making equipment. The money is coming from Ottawa's $62 million Canadian Seafood Stabilization Fund. Newfoundland and Labrador's NDP leader admits her 53-vote loss in the provincial election stings, but she says it's symbolic of a vote plagued with problems. Alison Coffin says she may ask for a judicial recount, but will discuss that option first with her party. Elections NL released preliminary results in the 10-week pandemic-interrupted and delayed provincial election on Saturday, showing Premier Andrew Fury's Liberals earning 22 of 40 seats for a slim majority. The Progressive Conservatives won 13 seats, the NDP won two, and three independents were elected. Mr. Fury comfortably won his seat, but both Ms. Coffin and PC leader Chess Crosby lost theirs. Coming up next, an interview from this past week with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation on the decision by the Supreme Court of Canada to uphold the federal carbon tax. More when we return. Stay with us. Last week, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the federal carbon tax in a 6-3 to three decision, despite legal challenges by Ontario, Alberta and Saskatchewan. The three provinces have argued that the carbon tax was a representation of an unconstitutional intrusion on the rights of provinces. This ruling deems that the carbon tax is constitutional and gives Ottawa the authority to ensure provinces and territories have pricing standards for carbon. Next steps for this plan include implementing the Liberal government's Paris Climate Change Plan, which was released in December, which includes a hike in the carbon tax to $170 a tonne by 2030. However, Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson told CBC News that these measures include a plan to slightly exceed the current Paris target agreement, and a new target would be announced in April. Aaron Woodrick, federal director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, says this tax represents higher costs for millions of Canadian families and businesses. Mr. Woodrick joins us now. Always great to have you on Forum Daily, Mr. Woodrick. Thanks so much for having me. So let's start by discussing uh, what the Supreme Court ruling last week means for the carbon tax. Well, all it really means, Nima, is that the carbon tax is legal. It doesn't say anything about whether it's good policy or bad policy. The Supreme Court just had to figure out whether or not this was something that was properly within the jurisdiction of Ottawa rather than the provinces. Um, they've said that it is, uh, but that doesn't change the fact that uh, for a lot of uh, people and groups, including our own, we still think this is bad policy. So we accept that it's illegal for uh, Mr. Trudeau to do this, uh, but we still think it's a bad idea and that he should, that he should scrap it. And we know Ontario, Alberta and Saskatchewan had legal challenges against this decision. How would the carbon tax impact these provinces in particular? Yes, uh, the backstop doesn't apply to every province. So three of the provinces to whom it applies had challenged this law on those grounds they have lost now. So now they'll have a decision to make. Do they accept Mr. Trudeau's backstop imposed on uh, people in their province? Or are they going to come up with some alternative policy themselves that meets the federal standards? So that's a choice that, uh, that premiers in those provinces are going to have to wrestle with. Now, I want to bring this back to the viewers at home. How would this carbon tax uh, impact individual Canadians' wallets? Well, the most straightforward way is it's going to make things more expensive for you. Uh, so the simplest uh, example is when you go fill up your car at the gas station. Um, each year this goes up. It represents three or four cents per liter. Um, so, you know, by the time this reaches its $170 per ton limit in 2030, you're looking at anywhere between $20 to $30 to fill up your car. That will just be in tax. So it is going to be significant over time. Um, also, anything that you buy that has to be transported on a truck, for example, is going to have to have that cost baked in. There is a rebate involved. I don't want to deny that there is, but the government is claiming that it is somehow going to collect all this revenue and spit it back out in a way that's going to give everybody even more money than they had before. So it's some dubious math. Uh, but really, the bottom line is it's going to mean life's going to become more expensive for Canadians. And uh, would this impact all Canadians equally or would it depend on the provinces they live in and the job sectors that they're in? Yeah, a lot depends on what you do in your lifestyle. Um, if you live uh, in a small condo in a major city and you don't drive and you ride a bike, it will not impact you as much. Uh, but if you live in a rural area, if you need to drive a lot, if where you work or the business you own, um, you know, involves anything that uh, produces more carbon emissions, you are going to really get hit by this. 
Now, meanwhile, we have Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson uh, saying that the government is planning to slightly exceed the current Paris target agreement. Uh, what do we know so far about this potential increase? Well, I think, first of all, it's some wishful thinking on the minister's part. Um, even the carbon tax increase, which they have planned, is not going to get us to Paris targets. Uh, so they are going to have to plan something else that is going to increase costs even more, because that is the bottom line. There's no way to get to Paris targets without imposing serious cost burdens on Canadians. So if he's pledging to go beyond that, uh, Canadians can read that as meaning it's going to cost them even more. And we know the Canadian Taxpayers Federation had a legal ba battle against this carbon tax plan as well. Uh, now that that's off the table, what are the next steps for CTF in this effort? Yes, we were the only non-government organization to join in with uh, the, the governments of Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario to challenge this law. We're very proud of that. Uh, there were a lot of groups on the other side of this. But, uh, you know, we've said all along we would use any tool at our disposal to speak up for taxpayers and fight this tax. Um, the legal avenue is now closed off. But as I said off the top, we still believe this is a bad policy just because the government is able to do it. It really doesn't mean they should. And we urge the Trudeau government or any future government to scrap this tax. All right, sir, 30 seconds left, but how can Canadians add their voices or concerns to this policy? Well, I certainly encourage Canadians to let it be known both to their provincial and federal governments how they feel about this tax. Uh, you know, a lot of people are concerned about climate change, but the reality is this would be a very expensive way to do anything about it. And Canada is a very small country in the big picture. So it's a lot of economic pain at the end of the day for very little um, environmental gain. All right, Mr. Woodrick, always great having you on Forum Daily. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. Stay with us. More to come after the break. We'll be right back. U.S. President Joe Biden is outlining a huge $2.3 trillion plan to re-engineer the country's infrastructure over the next eight years. He is billing it as a once-in-a-generation investment in America that will help the U.S. compete with China, create millions of jobs, and promote tax fairness. Skeptical Republican lawmakers are unlikely to embrace the plan without big changes. Much of the money would come from undoing former President Donald Trump's big corporate tax cuts. Afghan officials say attackers have gunned down a policewoman in eastern Afghanistan as she was headed to work, the latest targeted killing in the war-torn country. Provincial police said the officer was shot and wounded and later died at the hospital. Two suspects have been arrested by police. Afghanistan has seen a nationwide spike in bombings, targeted killings and violence on the battlefield as peace negotiators in Qatar between the Taliban and the Afghan government have stalled. After months of torture and interrogations in a Hamas prison, Gaza activist Rami Aman says he was offered an unconventional proposition. Divorce your wife and you are free to go. Mr. Aman had recently signed a marriage contract with the daughter of a Hamas official, and the ruling Islamic militant group wanted to dispel any insinuation that it supported Mr. Aman's outreach to Israeli peace activists. Mr. Aman says he eventually caved into the pressure. His experience underlines the tough constraints on free expression in the Hamas-ruled territory. Seven Hong Kong pro-democracy advocates have been convicted on charges of organizing and participating in man massive anti-government protests in 2019. The seven include media tycoon Jimmy Lai, as well as Martin Lee, which is, who is a veteran of the city's democracy movement. They were convicted of their involvement in the protest, where 1.7 million people marched in opposition to a proposed bill that would have allowed suspects to be extradited to mainland China. Niger's government says that an attempted military coup was stopped overnight at the presidential palace by security forces. The coup attempt took place just two days before President Mohamed Bazoum's inauguration, raising fears of more violence in the coming days. The West African country faces unprecedented attacks from Islamic extremists in the troubled region near the border with Mali. Mexico's electoral tribunal has ruled that President Obrador cannot talk about his administration's achievements during the campaign leading up to the June 6th midterm elections. The court's ruling on Wednesday places the president in a tough spot. He has held news conferences almost every weekday since he took office in late 2018. The court ruled that all government officials must avoid things that constitute political, personal or electoral propaganda government achievements that might influence the outcome of the elections. 
India is accelerating its vaccination drive by opening it up for everyone above 45 years old. India's catering to domestic cases has resulted in delays of global shipments of up to 90 million doses, setting back supplies in developing countries that are reliant on Indian exports. India has exported more vaccines, about 64 million doses, than it has administered in its own population, at 62 million doses. Even though India has not officially banned any exports, officials say that there may be a need to calibrate the supply schedules from time to time. France is now Europe's largest coronavirus danger zone, but President Emmanuel Macron is resisting calls for dramatic action. The government refuses to acknowledge failure and it blames delayed vaccine deliveries and a disobedient public for soaring infections and saturated hospitals. Mr. Macron's critics blame arrogance at the highest levels. They say France's leaders ignored warning signs and favored political and economic calculations over public health. Microsoft has won a nearly $22 billion contract to supply U.S. Army combat troops with its augmented reality headsets. The technology is based on Microsoft's HoloLens headsets, which were originally intended for the video game and entertainment industries. Microsoft's head-mounted HoloLens displays let people see imagery superimposed over the physical world in front of them, which the Pentagon says could boost soldiers' awareness of their surroundings and their ability to spot targets and dangers. Pope Francis has opened the solemn final days of Holy Week with a morning mass in St. Peter's Basilica, but he plans to skip the traditional Thursday afternoon service that commemorates Jesus' Last Supper with his apostles. Pope Francis is 84 and suffers frequent bouts of sciatica nerve pain, so he may have opted to delegate the service, given his busy liturgical schedule over the coming days that culminates with Easter Sunday Mass. All of the Vatican's Holy Week events are being celebrated before limited numbers of masked faithful to respect COVID-19 restrictions. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news from this past week. Remember, for more news on demand, you could always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and be sure to follow us on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter handles for updates. You can also watch all our news and commentary programming on the News Forum YouTube channel. All right, thank you for joining us, and have a great weekend, everyone. See you next time.